Okay, as we continue with our first vector project, I wanted to go over our course outline as we get into spring break next week and then beyond it, right? So what we got introduced to at the end of last class in the last video was the first proving ground. This is doing what are called thumbnail sketches. They're called thumbnail sketches because they're small. They do not need to be at all resolved. They just need to be quick, exploratory approaches right, that then we will refine after we've kind of chosen our direction. And in order to get credit for your proving ground, which will be due today, you need to create three thumbnail sketches, three small approaches to your logo design in three different styles. One that's central symmetrical, one that's dynamic, and one that plays with positive and negative space. That gets you half of those points, and then the other half comes from you critiquing someone else's basically just commenting on a class member's sketches and saying which of their approaches you prefer. Because that input will help them, just like their input will help you. We're going to get introduced today to vector programs. So in this class, Adobe Illustrator. In my afternoon class, the freeware version, which is called vector.com. And understanding the differences between raster and vector imaging more and more. And then next class we'll be working on that because there'll be a lot of new things to get used to hopefully we will all be in illustrator working on our our final vector black vector shape by next class that would be the the latest you want to be there so definitely get your sketches done by today and then we have a week off and then unit nine is mentioned in here because group presentations happen on the Monday we return. So you also want to check in with your group this week. Know what still is needed in your Google Slides. We're going to make sure by next class everyone has a Google Slides link and everyone's aware of, of where they're putting their, their content. So then when we come back from spring break, our logos will be due. We'll do a color version to our black shape logo and then we're going to print it almost immediately because you're all going to be required to print your logo just as an 8x10 along with two other artworks from the first half of class. Print them and map them. You can see details in the syllabus under the supplies. And that critique will be on March 20th. That full class midterm gallery critique where we're not just viewing it like a presentation critique from our screens but from printed objects that become your portfolio by the end of class. So also on that Monday when we return, your group presentations will happen. We'll also review for our midterm exam. So presentations will take up about half of the class. We have six groups. You're each hopefully going to do around 10 minutes for your presentation. So that should leave us with, with half of the class to do midterm review and printing. And then our midterm exam is on that following Wednesday. That's when all of your questions of the day from the first half, including the one for this unit that's first deadline is today. So questions of the day one through three, and then all our exercises, all the things that you could turn in if you didn't get them in on time, right? Assignments, you have to get in something on time. And that will all inform your full midterm grade. Now, because this is midterm week, your midterm grades are actually going to be due on Monday, March 18th. And so I put your engagement grades in there. You know, you want to improve that as much as you can, but you'll still have chances to impact that with your presentation and with your exam. And your real midterm grade, which is closer to 50 points out of 100, will be after week nine. So we have a somewhat late midterm in this class. All right. So with that... We're going to go to Unit 8 and remind ourselves of what that is. So we can go to Home to do that in the Unit Modules, or we can just go right to Modules. But we're looking at Unit 8. Actually, we're looking at Unit 9. Unit 8 is our group presentations. So we are looking at that. But Unit 9 is where Vector Design is. Ha ha. That should be down here. So parts of Unit 9, the first is a reminder of what is the difference between a vector and a raster image. 
And to help you with that, not only what are the differences and what advantages, but when should you use vector-based? When is it more effective than a pixel-based image? Basically, when you need perfect clarity and when you need versatility in scale, right? You need a vector. Perfect for t-shirt designs. Why t-shirt designs? Right. Because you have small t-shirts and you have large t-shirts. Right? And t-shirt designs, you don't want to see pixels. You want kind of clean edges on everything. So though you can do pixel-based pixel t-shirt designs, it is not recommended, it is not the industry standard. You always usually want to have vectors for that, for anything that's silkscreen. What about logo design? Well, logo is clearly the best case for a vector because logos need to be small or large or anything in between, and a vector can do that all from one file. And you def definitely never want to see pixel edges you know, in someone's brand identity. And if you think of all the things logos get used for, they get used for embroidery, they get used for the sides of trucks, they get used for latch hook rugs, they get used for uh, plush toys, you know, all kinds of things. They get engraved on the sides of knives. All these ways logos are used, Vector gives you the, the cleanest possible communication for it. So I have this link to these slides, and this has the video that you can refresh your memory on from the very beginning of class on the differences between vectors and raster images, the old name for raster being bitmap. And this is actually a nice kind of pause from this slide. They're good at different things. Vectors are made to be simple, clean, limited in color, and infinitely scalable. Raster images are good for lots and lots of details, gradations, subtlety, things like photographs, really hard to make a vector of a photograph. Right? And that can be good for really small pixel-based needs, things like icons for desktops, which are always going to be made with pixels anyway. So if you use a vector for that, you're actually using more processing power than if you used a raster image. So when we looked at early, well, let's just, yeah, we'll just go through these really quickly. So this is a little My Little Pony illustration, right? But this is pixel-based. How do we know? Well, we can actually see the pixels when we zoom in on it. Let's say it's this is made to be on a website, right? But if you zoom in on that website image, you're going to see this pretty clearly because it's designed for screen resolution. And also, you'll see there's a difference between the pixels in the hair here and the pixels on the, the creature. And that's because when you composite with different resolutions and you make them match the same pixel grid, you get those kind of shifts. Like we'll see in our composites sometimes where one reference we used had to get rasterized and, and upsampled a little bit more than something else. So maybe one mountain was a little bit sharper than another mountain. That can happen with, with pixel-based images a lot, right? Because you have those resolution issues. With a vector, just tracing this as a vector, everything is perfectly clean no matter how much you zoom in. But everything's going to be pretty simple and flat as well. Now, in early character design, and I know we're going to see some of this in your presentations, they had to use pixel-based because they had such limited memory. And they were designing it for a kind of screen resolution for old arcade games. So we're looking at the first design of Mario, which was in the, the first Donkey Kong game. And this is what's called 8-bit pixel design, because you had very little memory to hold all the sprites. So everything had to be designed in these very, very chunky pixels. Nowadays, I think this is the design from Paper Mario, you know, a much later game. Nowadays, sprites have to be more flexible, right? Because you have them on high def screens, on 4K screens, you have them on handheld devices, you want them to always be clean. And so they'll do vector outlines, and then they'll do actually gradient fills. They'll actually sometimes do raster fills, sometimes vector fills, but that takes a lot of processing to do gradients and vectors, you can. But that's the difference, right? That's a big leap, even for just a two-dimensional character between being able to, to see the kind of stair-step pixels and just everything being perfectly clean. 
then that gets easily taken into 3D. So here we have a, a vector-based outline that's automatically rendering itself around a 3D model because the model, the polygons are all vectors, but then the pixels inside the polygons, those are all rasters. So again, it's a lot like this where the outline is a vector, but then it's filled in with raster, you know, pixel-based color. Because as long as the outline is clean, everything inside will seem clean. And then you can just strip the outline and fill that, and you get that to be the same resolution at any scale. No matter what kind of ways you're going to, to color it, and we're going to be learning this with illustration. So once we understand vector imaging for our logos, which we'll just use vectors for, then we're going to start combining them with raster imaging. So doing, like in this case, vector line art and then raster color fills in between. Or even for our logo project, we're going to design a black shape logo like the USA or the HBO or the Disney. But then we're going to be adding color with layer styles in Photoshop, which is a way of doing it in a raster way, even though it will be perfectly scalable. So, we talked about the difference between uh, pictorial logos, which is what we're designing for this project, and logo types, which we're not doing yet, but we'll be designing type in a later project, and then combine marks, which use both the, the type together. If you're going to use letter forms of any kind in your sketches, limit them to just initials, right? And make them purely pictorial, like really blend them into the image. So USA is a good example of that. It's really becoming about shapes. You know, it's not just choosing a, a typeface and then spacing it well. But it would probably be a good idea to steer clear of letter letter design as much as you can. Right? But if, it, if it's necessary for your idea, like I put the N, the L, and the C in this, you can still play with it in the N there. Just make sure it's very pictorial. So we really need to understand these three different approaches, central, symmetrical, dynamic, play with positive and negative space. And so instead of just going through the slides we looked at last time, before we get into Illustrator proper, let's go to the assignment itself. And we can always shortcut to it, but this is going to be Unit 9. And I'm going to go right to the end, past the question of the day, past the examples, right to where we post our proving ground. So this is the, the same presentation, right? I just want to make sure you really kind of understand what's in there. It's going to help you with your midterm exam too. And then what are thumbnail sketches? If you're not used to that term, it's just a way of doing some quick concept work. I like this illustration here. This is for, you know, vehicle concept design. But the whole idea of a thumbnail sketch is you do not fill a page with it. You fit several on a page. It might be a little bit bigger than your thumbnail. It doesn't need to be that much bigger. So we're doing quick preparatory sketches here. And I'm forcing you to do them in ways that might not be comfortable. So central symmetrical, pretty comfortable. But then playing with a way that's dynamic and the eye moves through it at speed, that might be a challenging for you. And then the play of positive and negative space, really difficult to understand the shapes. This is the one I would usually tackle third, right? And they did this by, they're kind of combining this idea of a flower and a butterfly in all of them. And so in the positive negative space, they cut the butterfly out of the larger wing. <clears throat> all right. So my suggested theme, if you don't have a better one for yourself, is to do a, a spirit animal vector tattoo slash logo. Why do I say tattoo? I want you to like this approach so much. I want it to be so personal and so not generic that you would put it on your own body. Right? So we're not just looking for reproducing like the CBS logo you know, and making a little addition. We're trying to find our own visual language here. So I'm inspired personally by kind of Mayan uh, pictoglyphs. And I did some traveling you know, over the, the winter break and got to see a lot of that in Mexico. And so 
what do I 